Welcome to this talk. I'm from the University of Edinburgh from the School of Informatics. And in fact, our communication team has said, please tell everybody that there's been 60 years of computer science and AI at the University of Edinburgh. So now you know there's lots of events happening this year. Um, I'm going to use the term computer science in this talk, um, but I'm using it in a very broad way. So I work in I am a computer scientist. I've recently moved into a role where I do research software engineering. I'll tell you a bit more about that. And the question that came to my mind after interacting with various RSEs is, does research software engineering play out differently in computer science? And I want to talk specifically about something called artifact evaluation that happens at computer science conferences that I think might be of interest for the RSE community. So to start off, some of you may be familiar with Betridge's law of headlines that says any headline that ends in a question mark can be answered by the word no. Fortunately, this is not a headline. This is not a newspaper. This is a set of slides at a conference. So Betridge's law doesn't apply. Will this presentation answer this question? I had bold ambitions when I submitted my abstract, but it's taken quite a lot of work. It's been very enjoyable work. So I'm only going to start answering the question and I'm going to concentrate on artifact evaluation. But a little bit about me because I've had a slightly non-traditional career. So, well, how did I get here? And anybody who's a Talking Heads fan might immediately get an earworm from that but maybe not. And I also took three trains. But more seriously, I was thinking about this and I realized it's been, and I can't really believe this, it's been almost 30 years since I started my PhD in computer science at the University of Edinburgh. So I did a little chart, a timeline, um, the flags indicate the countries I was in, there's South African flags and Scottish flags, and I've highlighted some of the important issues. But um, 30 years ago in October, I started my PhD at the University of Edinburgh. Um, I moved back to South Africa where I lectured for a couple of years, and then I finished my PhD. So there was a bit of a delay there, unintentional. I then had a fellowship for a year. I worked as a lecturer. Um, for a number of years, um, I was able to have a sabbatical in Edinburgh, which was really great. And really the, the big issue came up. My partner started his PhD in Oxford and we had a two body problem. I decided I didn't want to stay in South Africa on my own. Although when I was doing my PhD, he was in South Africa on his own. Um, and I moved to Edinburgh and I was very fortunate to quickly get a job as a researcher. And I've been working as a grant funded um, fixed term contract researcher since 2007 at the University of Edinburgh with a couple of breaks. So I don't know if I'm hitting some sort of record there. Um, in early 2017, a large project finished and I had to make a decision about what to do next. And luck had it, there was an ad for a job in the school and it was exactly what I was interested in. So that delayed the de decision for a while. But then um, at the beginning of 2020, um, I had submitted a large research grant. Uh, because I'm a fixed term contract researcher, I cannot do that on my own with the EPSRC. And I had to have an adult, a real academic to join me on that. And I'm very thankful to the person who did volunteer to do that, but we weren't successful. And so it was time for a major rethink of what I was doing. So the, the research application I had put in was very much my own ideas um, of what I thought would be useful. It was for um, hardware. It was all about modeling hardware. Um, and I thought, no, I'm going to take a step back now. I'm, I don't want to proceed with my own research. I'd like to support other people in their research goals. So I found an interesting position still at Edinburgh, and part of my research is research software engineering, and I will say that a bit more about that as I in the next few slides. Um, 
But the the category of working with and as a researcher was interesting because I kind of embody both. Um, I've had many years as a researcher, but now I'm doing research software engineering. And I've been a bit uncomfortable in some of the earlier talks where we felt like there's researchers over there and RSEs over there, and there's a bit of conflict. Um, I hope I'm, I don't experience that conflict internally. So as I can see, we are now here where the yellow arrow is. So I've had a I've done a lot of different things in my research career. I actually did research into how people learn recursion at one point. And this is the cloud um, from the word cloud from the ACM, which is the Learn Society for Computer Science from their website for my publications. So I thought a bit about what I did, and I really don't want to go through this in detail, but um, looking back, I discovered that I did have a research software engineering position in the 90s when I was employed during um, a university vacation to implement an algorithm in C from a paper. So at that point, no software was available online. If you wanted to do it, you had to take the original paper and do it from scratch. Um, then. Oops. More recently, as I said, I've been a researcher at Edinburgh, and I spent a lot of that time developing dynamic models of various types, but I didn't write software, and I used software developed by others. However, there are similarities um, in using model modeling approaches to software development. And right now, I develop applications in a particular language called Lynx, and I'll say a bit more about that. So Lynx is, is a tearless programming language, and the idea is you can develop applications in Lynx in a single language. It does the database backend for you. You don't have to write SQL statements. It's all hidden behind the scenes, and it generates the JavaScript front end for you. So if this, if this sounds to any of you like a brilliant programming language to use to develop the type of thing you're interested in, do please talk to me about it. So one of its core features is called language integrated query. So this captures the idea that without having to write database specific statements, you can interact with your data using, uh, for example, the language supports iteration over lists, but it also supports iteration over database tables in a very natural way. I work with somebody who's interested in data provenance, so where um, data comes from, how it changes over time, and most recently we started working with temporal databases to track changes in data within a database over time. And we're applying this both in the area of curated scientific databases and also metrology, the science of measurement. So I'm working with people at the National Physical Laboratory to help them with some particular issues they have to do with calibration. And when I started this new job in 2020, the pandemic had started. It was all a bit dramatic. I didn't know how this would work out. And I'm really pleased um, more than three years later to say it's really come together. So the yellow kind of captures the research I do, but then the blue things capture the things that I've been involved in. I talk to people at, um, about fair data. I've been to RDA events because we're always looking for use cases for our temporal database stuff. Open science, I didn't realize this, but I'm actually passionate about science being done well. And open science is part of that and good quality software is part of that. So that's come together. Data quality is important. And the metrologists are particularly interested in that. And I'm also another thing, because I've been on fixed term contracts for so long, I'm passionate about sustainable careers for people who do, do research jobs that are currently funded by fixed term contracts. I won't belabor that anymore. If anybody wants to know why I've put in those links about provenance, please speak to me afterwards. So back to the question, is this different? Certainly within some communities in computer science, it is assumed that you know how to code. You will be able to develop software. And for some jobs, particularly RA positions, you will develop software. But also people are employed to do this. 
This doesn't remove the general need for research software engineers. Computer science is not different enough to say we don't need such people. And I also believe research students should not be used as low paid software engineers. We need to develop. I have no objection to PhD students developing software. I think it's important, but that's not their main role. And there are certainly, I think there are abuses by supervisors, perhaps only in my discipline, where they develop software to the extent that their research is affected. But anyway, let me let me leave the rants for later. So are there common goals for research software? So here are some of the R words that I came up with. I'll just explain them quickly. So um, respect comes from computer science, some idea that if you're in programming languages or software engineering, that your software isn't important as your publications and it should be shown the same respect. Reusability is crucial. We want software that is developed to be used and to be modified by others. Repeatability, um, also important. Hopefully when you write some software and you use it again, your own software, you'll get the same results. Reproducibility takes this one step further. And the question is, can the results you get be achieved by other people? So I always think of the O in reproducibility means others. Can it be reproduced by others? And then finally, replicability is can somebody else write new software that will obtain the same results. And I like to think of this as N version programming. So when you're de developing um, computer systems that need to be really reliable, you will often write different pieces of code to achieve the same thing and then take a vote on it. But the things I'm going to concentrate on now are the respect aspects, the reusability aspects, and the reproducibility aspects. There's a number of uh, ways, things to support achieving these goals, and I just don't have time to go through this, but I want to highlight some of them. So the ones in green at the bottom are the things I'll be talking about now, ACM badging and artifact evaluation. And the things in the uh, with the outline are things outside computer science, which are similar to the things that I'm talking about. I've also got a question mark there. If anybody is aware of things that are similar to what I'm talking about, please do let me know about them. So first of all, is there an R crisis in computer science? And yes, there's quite a few papers about this. So these are some nice graphics from those papers. Um, so what are people doing about this? So there are two main things. One is the badging and one is the artifact evaluation, and they've kind of been tied together. So the badging is for any artifact, which is defined as a digital object that plays a role in research. And here I'm just really focusing, because we're at a research software engineering conference, I'm talking about software. And then artifact evaluation is a process that was developed in the software engineering and PL communities by somebody called Shuram Krishnamurthy and others. And their goal was to, they wanted to evaluate artifacts that came with papers to show respect for those artifacts, for that software, but also to assess after you've read the research paper, does the software you see meet the expectations that the paper has created in your mind. So that's a bit fuzzy, but it has been linked up with the badging. So how does the badging work? Ah, oh, before, before I go on further, I spoke about replicability and reproducibility. And I just want to highlight, if you're writing any papers on this topic, the ACM actually changed, switched the meanings. So papers before 2020 will use it will use it to mean reproducibility. So just want to highlight that. So here are two of my own papers that have got badges. Um, I can't say I was very involved in the badging process because I didn't write much of the software. Um, so this was pre-2020. So these badges talk about replicability, but really it's about reproducibility. I mean, somebody took the models and took the software that we had ran them again and checked that the same results were achieved. Um, so the badges that you can get, there's one which is just artifacts available. So that just says it's downloadable somewhere from the web. There's a functional assessment. 
There's also another red badge, which is slightly different, which is a reusability assessment. So that goes into more detail than the functional one. And then there are the two blue badges, the replicated and the reproduced. And if this paper was published today, it would have the reproduced one, not the repli replicated one. Um, and then this was an old style badge that was used. And in fact, for this paper, um, both of these papers were in ACM tractions on transactions on modeling and computer simulation. Um, this was actually the first paper at, ever to have this type of artifact evaluation in that journal. So the way this typically works for some of the journals, not all of them, but some of them, is the paper gets accepted. You then send a link to where your software or your model can be found. It's reviewed. And then in the case of this particular journal, there is actually a short report written by the person who'd done the evaluation to say they got the same results as you. Um, and other journals just do the badging and don't do the comments, so it's similar. Um, it also is used at conferences, and something that's a bit weird about computer science is that conference publications are often much more important than journal publications, which puts us out of step with the rest of the publishing world. And there's actually been some recent move to start publishing things in journals that are called proceedings journals so that they get counted as journal papers. But anyway, that's an aside. Um, so the general procedure in a conference that has artifact evaluation is standard submission of papers. Then accepted papers, again, have the option to submit artifacts for evaluation. There's a review by a separate committee. It's not the program committee. And this includes early career researchers because there is this perception that they are most likely to be technically savvy and will be able to deal with problems with the software. Then there's badging of papers and some conferences will actually publish results of what papers were evaluated and what badges they got. There's been some move to compulsory evaluation. Some conferences have tool tracks and they have required evaluation for tools, which if it makes sense, if you're actually writing about a software tool, you probably should have some evaluation of it. And then one conference I found that I thought was really interesting um, is there's a procedure, it's quite a small conference, where all accepted papers get evaluated for reproducibility, and then there's something written about it. So this plays out in different ways across computer science. So the databases people were the first people to look at this. Then, as I mentioned, um, Shriram Krishnamurthy and others looked at this in the context of software engineering and programming languages in 2011. And it's now pretty common across a whole range of, I would say, traditional computer science disciplines. And not all of them use ACM badges. There are other badges as well. It's a lot less common in AI and machine learning, and it's playing out differently there. So the expectation is when you submit your paper, you will submit a link to your code, and your paper reviewer has an option to look at that link and maybe ask questions on reproducibility as well. Personally, I'm not sure that's a good, good way forward, but there is at least one ML conference that's doing something slightly different. But uh, the, this MLSIS conference actually is about machine learning for computer systems. So it kind of falls in the other category. And evaluation can obviously very be very difficult in certain areas. Um, HPC being an obvious example, if you can't get access to the same equipment, how are you going to do the evaluation? Um, robotics, you may need specialized equipment as well. What are the criteria? And it's difficult to give a concrete answer to that. There tends to be community specific and artifact specific. Uh, when you're doing simulations, what does getting the same results mean if you're assessing for reproducibility? And there is conflict between, is reproducibility the goal of artifact evaluation or is it reusability? So that is something that's still not kind of pinned down yet. There are some people doing this evaluation outside the publishing process as well. 
And I just want to highlight that the criteria for artifact evaluation tend to be these reusability, reproducibility things. There are other criteria that would fall that, that don't take part of that, like performance, for example. There's been a couple of papers written um, about the evaluation process. Does it work? Um, have the goals been achieved? Which of course raises the question of what are the goals, which is what I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, there's, uh, I'm not going to go through these points, but essentially in preparing this presentation, I created um, two bibliographies that consider these questions. I read a lot of papers, wanted to make sure that they were available. So they're at the end of the slides if you're interested in them. So to summarize, is it different? Yes and no, but we have an interesting process in computer science, some parts called artifact evaluation that could be useful. And also computer science is where research into software engineering takes place. So um, there are people in computer science in the software engineering community who are interested in talking to people to develop research software. So they do model driven engineering and there is a research workshop coming up and um, there is funding to attend it. So if you'd like to hear more about it, please let me know. And just what ne is next for this? I would like feedback from all of you. If you have comments on whether this process, you think this process would work, how it could be modified. Um, one of the issues is where does the time come to do this process? Um, I'm hoping to participate in an artifact evaluation committee. Um, and I'd like to public publish what I've done so far um, and find funding for further work. So if anybody has funding, let me know. And I have some thanks to some of the people who helped me, both Shuram and people in the school I work in. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and any questions, comments or feedback. You can reach me at these points. Thank you very much. Um, so as is the rule, I have to take questions by Slido. Okay. Or not. Um, the first one with a bit quiet, yeah. shy. The first one is, um, have you experienced resistance to the, quote, respect for software as a research outcome, quote, idea in your uh, computer science departments? Or is it more of an external pressure that's driving the publication first view? Um, I'm, so I'm going to talk about the first bit. I'm not quite sure if I understood the second bit. So certainly we, um, people are probably aware of the hidden ref and what sort of thing gets submitted to the real ref. And as far as I know, we haven't submitted any software to the real ref. So yeah, the, there's still not a lot of respect paid, I think. Um, uh, so what was the second I, part I think of that? that? Does, I think that does answer the second part. part. The second part is, is there any external, is it external pressure that drives the publication first view, which I guess. Yes, yes. I, th I think it's very similar to other sciences, but yeah. It's the publication that that counts, but the, the people who run the ref keep saying software should be refable. Um, is this going to materialize for the next ref? I'm not really sure. Um, okay, uh, the next question: How are people doing the artifact evaluation rewarded? Is it standard practice to credit them in the published paper? I don't think it's standard to. Um, no, there's likely to be in the proceedings, there will be a list of both the Artifact Evaluation Committee and the Programme Committee. So reward is a big issue, um, both for people submitting artifacts and also for people doing the work. Um, yeah, let's take one more question. Uh, it's very upvoted. How do we check reproducibility without putting a burden on unpaid reviewers. Also a bigger problem for HPC code is where can you even run it? So yes. for example, if it needs 4,000 cores and 24 hours of compute. Yes, for someone to really yes, that, 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 that is a big question. Um, yes, it's more unpaid research. I fully accept this. Um, I think this is just such an issue in science. Um, there is a nice article I haven't quite read about um, the, the invisible labor in open science. Others of you might be familiar with it. And yes, I don't know, I don't know the answer to the question, but something needs to be done reviewing as well. It's, yeah. 
Okay. Thank you very much.